let me introduce our first speaker. Although, like all our speakers, she needs no introduction. Annalisa Day QC recently described, and I have to say I particularly like this quote, as an absolute rock star at the top of her game. Um, and so we're very much uh, very grateful to her for agreeing to do this talk. And she's going to talk to us about COVID-19 and construction claims. Over to you, Annalise. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll uh, tr endeavour to put my slides up on the screen. I hope you can all see that. Um, so where were we? We what were you all doing a year ago? Um, I suspect many of us would have been doing something different if we'd known quite what was coming and how fundamentally uh, different life would be. And I very much hope that at some time soon we will be able to come together for a tech bar conference in person. Um, I know that you know quite how sad life has become when I'm bemoaning the loss of a tech bar meeting. Um, but for now, you're stuck with me on screen and I can't see any of you. Um, but against that background, I wanted to consider today uh, the current and future possible consequences of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic for construction law. I wanted to um, talk, first of all, about three overarching themes that I'm going to consider, and then we'll go on to look at the different types of claims that can be made in a COVID context. There are three particular things that I wanted to emphasise uh, at the outset. First of all, I think this is an area where there is a great deal of scope for mutual learning. So for comparative um, consideration, um, COVID-19 is obviously going to give rise to disputes in multiple jurisdictions at the same time, dependent on materially identical facts. Therefore, the benefit of comparative analysis will be even greater than normal. Secondly, there's the question of whether English jurisprudence will remain as it was prior to COVID or whether justice will lead to a different approach being taken. And I know Rachel, for one, has already been involved in one of the leading cases to come out of COVID to do with it, business interruption insurance, where perhaps one might say the judiciary seemed to be influenced by justice and certainly overturn some previous decisions. Thirdly, there's obviously the question of how many of these disputes will actually fight and make law as opposed to being settled. Certainly to date, I've seen a lot of settlements, but in a way, the longer this goes on, the more impact it may have. And it, I hope that it won't be long for us lawyers before there is a mega dispute that actually comes to trial. Now, I wanted to start by just refreshing our memories, casting our minds back to this time last year when uh, COVID first became apparent. And I wanted just to do a little comparison of two jurisdictions in this regard in terms of the legislative response. So I'm actually going to start with Ireland, uh, a close neighbour, but where the uh, reaction was somewhat different. So uh, the regulations that were passed there meant that people could not leave their homes without reasonable excuse. A reasonable excuse included providing an essential service. But you will notice that in Ireland, that definition was extremely narrow. And so far as construction projects are concerned, what you see on the slide there was the extent to which you would have a reasonable excuse for leaving. So essential health, critical road, rail and utility, essential or emergency maintenance and repair services. And the result of that was that the Irish construction industry ground to a complete halt as the vast majority of construction uh, projects uh, had to stop. The Labour obviously could not attend site. The UK government, by contrast, passed uh, the, the coronavirus regulations and those responsible for carrying on business or a service listed in Schedule 2 had to cease carrying on their business. There was no reference to construction. And whilst the general population could not leave their homes without reasonable excuse, Regulation 6F allowed people to travel for the purposes of work where it was, quote, reasonably necessary necessary 
and it was not, quotes, reasonably possible to work from home. So notwithstanding certain initial confusion, in England, construction sites were legally allowed to remain open. Um, that being said, many did uh, have to cease work due to an inability to comply with government advice and guidance um, provided by the Construction Leadership Council. There were also, of course, problems with domestic and global interruptions and um, supply chains. When we came to the second lockdown, it's interesting to note that in Ireland, for example, the definition of what was an essential service was widened to plainly now include uh, construction. The position in England was, was the same and indeed during the third lockdown has also remained the same. In England, after the first lockdown, we also had the, this additional guidance, um, which provided that um, people who work in critical national infrastructure, construction or manufacturing should continue to go to work. So actually a positive suggestion that those people direction should be going to work. Now, why am I going into any of this? It's because when you come to look at some of these doctrines, it is important to understand whether people were being prohibited legally from going or whether there was merely guidance in place and the root cause of why sites were not able to remain open is likely to be important. Now, before turning to look at the various doctrines that may arise in relation to COVID-related claims, I wanted to just talk about a decision that was decided um, in relation to Brexit, because of course, Brexit and COVID may raise similar claims. There may also be situations where you have both contributing to difficulties on a project. And there's a, a decision of uh, Mr. Justice Marcus Smith, which perhaps hasn't attracted as much attention as one might think. And I thought it would be useful just to uh, go through it today um, because it contains some observations on frustration, both in relation to Brexit, but which may also be applied by the courts in relation to COVID related claims. So what happened in that case was that the um, European Medicines Agency had a lease in uh, Canary Wharf and it used that uh, place as its headquarters. Now, the European Medicines Agency is a legal person created by EU law performing um, EU functions. And they tried to argue that Brexit had frustrated the lease. And their case was put in two ways. First of all, following Brexit, it would be ultra vires for the agency to continue to perform its lease obligations. So that was a supervening illegality argument. And secondly, that Brexit would frustrate the alleged common purpose of the lease, namely that Canary Wharf would be the agency's headquarters for the duration of the lease. And Mr Justice Marcus Smith decided in relation to the latter argument, the frustration argument, that the agency, quotes, had not come close to a case of frustration of common purpose. He said that this was simply a case in which hindsight revealed that too high a price for the premises had been paid. And it's, was, it's interesting to look at the reasons for his conclusion. So, some of the factors that he felt to be important were as follows. First of all, the lease represented the outcome of rival negotiations driven by different objectives. One might think that's often true of contractual negotiations. Secondly, because the lease contained alienation provisions, the parties had foreseen and catered for the possibility that the agency might vacate the premises at some point during the lease. And thirdly, that frustration of the lease would subvert the sophisticated contractual machinery by which Canary Wharf sought to ensure that it would be paid rent for the duration of the lease. 
So it, it, it's notable that the judge considered there was nothing to indicate the risk, that the risk of the consequences of the agency vacating the premises should turn on the reason why the agency was vacating. Canary Wharf was protected regardless of the reasons for vacating, since that was what the terms of the contract, which the parties had freely bargained, provided for. So this is a decision which takes a very narrow view on the scope of frustration and obviously makes clear that Brexit is extremely unlikely to constitute a frustrating event. The judge was very critical of any attempt to argue that an increase in price due to market forces would frustrate a contract. And he said that something more was needed. Also of note is the time period during which Brexit will be relevant and in particular the time period during which Brexit was not foreseeable. So the judge held in that case that that would be between 2011 and the months prior to the 2016 referendum. So I want then to turn to look at force majeure initially and I would suggest that this is likely to be your starting point um, when you're acting for a party seeking contractual relief from the impact of COVID-19. As we know, um, force majeure clauses depend upon a triggering event occurring. And such events typically involve unexpected circumstances outside of a contracting party's reasonable control that prevent or delay it from performing its contractual obligations. Obviously, you need to look at your individual contract and the wording carefully, but in broad terms, that's the essence of a force majeure clause. And upon the triggering event occurring, the relevant party may be able to benefit from being excused from performance or may have the ability to suspend or terminate the contract. Exceptionally, the triggering event might also result in financial relief. Now, force majeure disputes arising out of the COVID-19 pandemic are likely to focus on three things. First of all, has there been compliance with relevant notice provisions? Secondly, the identification of the relevant force majeure event. And thirdly, whether the event has had any necessary causal effect and finally, mitigation. So let's look first of all at the topic of notice provisions, something where I think construction lawyers are ahead of commercial lawyers often because it's something we come across regularly. Um, and so um, we are probably looking at three things that need to be checked where you have notice provisions. The first thing to make sure and don't always assume this is the case, is whether the provision is in fact a condition precedent or is it a mere intermediate term? Courts are generally reluctant to not classify notice provisions as conditions precedent, absent clear wording demanding compliance. Um, there's the SHV gas supply and trading SAS case, uh, which supports that but you do not have to have the words condition precedent used. And the resolution of this issue is notoriously dependent on the words of the specific contract. Second uh, issue that you need to be aware of is whether any formal requirements have been complied with. And particularly at the height uh, of the pandemic and particularly at the beginning, it may be that many parties to construction contracts did not in fact comply with the formal requirements necessary to give proper notice. And what will be interesting to see is what degree of latitude the courts or tribunals are willing to give parties when that has happened. And you will all be familiar with some of the case law on notice provisions um, whereby the courts have on occasion, some courts have given parties quite widely way um, and some have interpreted it more strictly. So again, that's a topic to be aware of and to ensure that you have thought about and covered. And then finally, have any timing requirements been complied with? Um, 
often you have to give notice promptly or within a, a specified time period. And such provision might adversely affect parties who decided to wait and see. Um, indeed, the event has now been going on for so long, and it may be at the beginning it was thought it wouldn't lead to consequences that it has now had. So in my view, timing is likely to be an issue. Second big area to look at and consider, and probably one of the most important areas, is identifying the triggering event that you are going to rely on. Um, some contracts will contain an exhaustive or indicative list of events, whilst others might set out a test for any given event, uh, and then you have to work out whether the specific event is a triggering event. And I've set out on the slide some of the relevant events that are common in construction contracts, um, the exercise by the government of statutory powers, and you will therefore perhaps see why I was talking at the beginning about what the government had and had not ordered. Secondly, shortage of necessary materials. Third, instructions by employers to postpone works due to be executed in light of safety concerns. Fourth, employers restricting site access, working hours or limiting working space on site. And then obviously collective action by workers in refusing to work due to safety concerns. So there are likely to be disputes over what uh, words such as law, guidance or advice mean in the context of these clauses. And you, you've, we've already seen some of those disputes within the business interruption case. It may also uh, be the case that you are retrospectively trying to rely on events that have happened later on. So, for example, when social distancing measures came in, um, the costs of making a site secure, complying with all those measures we now can recite by heart, to two metre social distance staggered work start times, sanitation of all um, tools, equ equipment and mobile plant. All of those are likely to have had impacts on schedule delivery programme for construction projects. Um, I, I must say, I've been to one site during the pandemic and the main problem seemed to be uh, getting people to go to the toilets, given the number of people on site and the need to, to socially distance. Uh, but there also seem to be a lot of people probably not two metres apart from each other. But be, be very clinical and clear about what your triggering event is and actually do stand back and think about what is likely to be a triggering event that actually falls within the clause. But secondly, that will make causation, for example, easier for me if you're trying to rely on the clause. And likewise, if you're the employer, obviously there are things that you can raise uh, in response. Now, I turn with some trepidation then just to look at causation in relation to force majeure. Most of these clauses require the triggering event to have caused, quotes, a prevention, hindrance or delay in performance. And again, this is where, depending on what legislative action the government has taken, um, it may be easier or harder to rely on these clauses. So where, for example, in England and Wales, you have clauses that it's insist on there being a prevention of performance, just be aware that that may be quite difficult to satisfy in circumstances where construction sites have been permitted by law to remain open. Such clauses typically demand that performance is rendered impossible rather than simply more or less difficult. That's the Tenants Lancashire case that you will see on the slide. And of course, even if prevention has occurred, that prevention must have been caused by the triggering event. And prior to the pandemic, there were two cases that were felt to be particularly relevant in this context. So CEDRAL is um, obligatory reading for anybody considering a force majeure claim. On one reading of the decision, the force majeure 
event must be the sole cause of the failure to perform. And on the facts of that case, it was considered that there were two effective causes of non-performance. First of all, a government moratorium on drilling and the government's unwillingness to approve a drilling plan. So they were both uh, effective causes. But because the drilling plan extended to an area wider than that subject to the moratorium, and secondly, the lack of approval would have prevented drilling even without the moratorium, it was held that the moratorium, that was the only qualifying triggering event, did not cause the non-performance in the relevant sense. So it is very, very likely that in the construction context, you will have multiple ca causes of non-performance or delayed performances that are able to be identified. So take the example of a construction company heading towards insolvency. The consequences of the pandemic are that it both becomes insolvent and that work ceases. And in such circumstances, you are likely to face difficult issues of causation. How you frame and present that case may be uh, incredibly uh, important. The position in England is then further complicated by the classic maritime case. That was a case in which the Court of Appeal held that the party seeking to rely on the force majeure provision in the relevant contract needed to be, quotes, ready, willing and able to perform, but for the force majeure event. And Lord Justice Mayles held that the failure to supply cargo could not be said to result from an event if, in fact, the event makes no difference because the charter was never going to supply the cargo anyway. And in my view, the causal wording in construction contracts will probably be interpreted in a similar way. Um, but a word of caution, obviously, as we've seen from the business interruption claim, don't necessarily assume that's the case and don't be afraid to put forward new arguments or argue that these decisions are inapplicable to uh, COVID uh, or indeed maybe need revisiting. Then, um, finally, I just wanted to look at the issue of mitigation. Um, Mr Justice Tears' decision in Cedral also provides the latest traditional analysis on the obligation to mitigate a force majeure event. Um, and I've set out on the slide the wording of the clause. Both parties would use their reasonable endeavours to mitigate. And one of the parties sought to argue that it was entitled to rely upon the fact that there was no business case for performance and or that it was not in its commercial interest to do certain things when seeking to say it had used reasonable endeavours. Um, and whilst Mr Justice Tier said those could be relevant considerations for the court, he also said that that would completely underline, uh, undermine the argument on causation. The cause of the failure to perform would then not be the morata moratorium, but rather that performing was more expensive or less attractive to Tullow. The, there was a caveat to his conclusion in this regard, which was that if the cost of performance would be entirely outside the contemplation of the parties, such as where performance cost 100 times the contract price, reasonable endeavours might be, might be satisfied. So we can see what's coming in order to determine where there's the balance between a mere difficulty of costs and prohibitive costs you're going to have to get into some quite difficult considerations that may be uh, hard to predict how the court or the tribunal will decide which, which side of the line they will decide on. And of course, the longer this pandemic goes on, the, the more likely, the, the greater the impact that there will be on the costs of uh, construction projects. Um, so we, we'll, we shall see what happens in that regard. So then let's talk a little bit about uh, frustration. And I don't know how many of you had to sort of dust off your knowledge of this doctrine when uh, COVID came in. Um, but just to remind everybody of the 
main, the leading case is obviously the national carriers case. Um, and the test frustration requires the four things that I've put up on the slide. First of all, a supervening event. Secondly, that must occur without default of either party. Thirdly, the contract must not make sufficient provision for that event. And then finally, that event must so significantly change the nature of the outstanding contract from what the parties could reasonably have contemplated at its time of execution that it would be unjust to enforce it. So you can see immediately there are quite a lot of hurdles to jump over to bring a successful frustration claim. The essential point to consider, in my view, is whether in the circumstances, the outstanding obligations that have to be performed or the significance of those obligations have changed so much that as a matter of justice, the true nature of the obligations must be regarded as different. So you are not likely to succeed in a claim for frustration where, for example, the contract has simply become more expensive to perform or an alternative method of performance is impossible or where your failure to perform is due to a problem with one of your suppliers, for example. However, there have been certain cases where frustration has been successful, and I've certainly seen lots of arguments recently to use those cases by analogy to bring either bring a frustration claim or to use this during uh, negotiations. So uh, again, they're quite old, both these cases. The Davis contractors claim um, shortage of labour and delays said to have to be exceptional in order for there to be frustration. And then obviously during the First World War, there was a prohibition on building operations and that was said that that did cause frustration. Given the government allowing construction sites to remain open, my own personal views, that's quite difficult to show, save on a project where the cost of social distancing is going to be just so prohibitively expensive that it does actually change the whole nature of the obligations. But these are complex matters. And Mr. Justice uh, Smith in the Canary Wharf case uh, considered lots of factors that might be relevant. Um, and he, his decision has a useful um, setting out of those different factors that you might want to look at, the party's knowledge, expectations, assumptions, contemplations in particular as to risk. Now, often those will not be recorded in the contract itself. Indeed, mostly they're not. And so this is an area where you may need to go and interrogate pre-contractual negotiations or subjective statements of intent. So next, I want just to talk about variations. Um, it, it's very, very likely that uh, construction contracts may have been varied by agreement, particularly where you have um, compliance with social distancing measures that will not only delay performance, but also lead to increased overheads and on-site site expenses. Be, be a little bit wary that many parties may have decided to vary or renegotiate parts of their contract in circumstances where the contracts may have required those variations to be in clear language and in writing. And certainly in the early days of the pandemic, it's in, it's, uh, so I've certainly seen situations where there's been an agreement orally or by telephone that isn't in accordance with the stipulations of the contract. And I'm sure you'll all be familiar with the Brock case decided by the Supreme Court saying that an oral variation was not valid unless it was in writing, because that's what the contract provided. It is an interesting question whether, given the circumstances of the pandemic, particularly in the early stages, will allow courts to find a way around that. But it is something um, to be aware of. <laughs> 
Then another topic that I've had coming up a lot by clients who want advice uh, on, I had someone do recently say, can I injunct someone for the liquidated damages clause not being applied? Um, so this is, this is going to start becoming a real worry, particularly as I think many agreements were reached early on, but now perhaps the parties are uh, not as amenable or, or the sums involved mean that agreement is simply impossible. So just to remind you that obviously the English position in 2015 restated by the Supreme Court, a pretty high test to satisfy in order to argue that the LD's clause is a penalty must be out of all proportion to any legitimate interest of the innocent party in the enforcement of the primary obligation. And obviously there's a very, quote, strong initial presumption that proper advise parties of comparable bargaining of the best judges of what is legitimate. And obviously, because the test is when the contract was entered into, be aware that what's happened subsequently may not be, be relevant. To, to date, the courts have obviously looked at enforcing the principle of freedom of contract. Again, you had uh, Richard Salter QC's decision in GPP Bigfield, uh, setting out that, again, the test was very, very high and the amount there, the LD's clause was upheld because the amount was not extravagant or unconscionable. But is there is there any room here for a revisiting of this principle in light of the pandemic? Uh, also, many of you will be aware, but in other jurisdictions, for example, Singapore, there have been there has been legislative action that's been taken to assist in the construction arena. Um, in Singapore, you had a, a temporary measures act that came in very soon after COVID. So there was a temporary moratorium on legal actions related to a party's inability to perform, uh, and then there was a disregarding of a period during which performance had not taken place. That was then replaced by the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Amendment uh, Bill, which has now been passed, which gave an automatic extension um, of 122 days in relation to uh, contracts entered before the 25th of March 2020. Uh, and again, I think this is interesting that Part 8B, where a contractor had been delayed and that inability was caused by a COVID-19 event to a material extent, so note the causation wording there, and the contractor incurs qualifying costs, then the contractor gets 50% of those costs from the employer. So a splitting of the pain, as it were. And certainly many of the voluntary agreements that I've seen reached between parties often involve splitting 50-50 down the line the impact of the pandemic because that's what's felt to be fair between everybody. Um, I finally just wanted to talk about, take off the slides, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on the process for resolving disputes, because COVID-19 doesn't just affect the substance of legal disputes, but as we all know, the process for bringing and resolving them. And the words, you are, on, you are on mute, has now become indelibly inked into the English language. And of course, this year as well, we've had cat, uh, cat faces also becoming coming well known. But I, I attended a lecture last night by the new Chancellor, Lord Justice Flo, which was very, very interesting. And what he said in terms was that in the business and property courts, remote and hybrid hearings are going to become a permanent feature. That doesn't mean that we will be having trials automatically remote or hybrid once the effects of the pandemic are, are less severe. But, but, and this is interesting, they are, the courts are looking at this as a way, for example, to have judges sitting in London, being able to deal with cases on circuit. And really, it's going to be down to an individual judge in each case to decide whether that hearing should be held in person, hybrid or remotely. So I think that's a, a fascinating um, 
development. And the courts are also looking at improving uh, the technological side of that. Um, but certainly it is going to be a permanent feature of certainly the court process going forward. For those of us who do arbitration, again, I suspect that people giving evidence by video will become more common, um, even when we can go back to having some people in the same room. Again, interim hearings, I think it's been transformational that those can be, be able to be done on the video. I was involved last year in doing a survey um, of clients, uh, advocates, in-house counsel on remote hearings. And the, the outcome of that was very, very interesting. And in particular, I just wanted to share with you that clients, actually many of them preferred remote hearings, which is very interesting, that the least advocates were the least keen on them. Um, but it is interesting. And I think we obviously need to listen to our clients. Um, and a lot of them said that it, it meant they could sort of watch the hearing without having to travel somewhere, without having to um, be involved in, in an in-person hearing. And that was often they felt beneficial. They also quite liked being able to see the advocates' faces rather than just sitting behind them. Uh, but I, I think that is an interesting development. We shall see what happens. I know in China they're trying to develop technology that will actually replicate a courtroom. Uh, more so you'll rather than just the zoom screen you'll be able to actually see the layout of people so we'll see when that comes in but uh, as as the chancellor said last night we there is also something wonderful <laughs> about advocacy in person and I, I do hope that we will all be able to um, see each other soon and and share ideas and yeah uh, I hope that you're all keeping well and safe and um, that's all I wanted to say today so Thank you for bearing with me on the tech and yeah, sending my best to all of you. Thank you very much, Annalisa. That was very interesting indeed. I'm interested to hear what you say about your survey because I completed a three week um, arbitration on, on a remote basis and I found it very difficult <laughs> um, just as an advocate, I think, to engage with the tribunal in the same way and to control witnesses when you're cross-examining them. So it's interesting to hear what the courts are saying as well. And I, I wonder, as you say, it may be more interim hearings and, and hearings that are submissions only that, that, that we'll see more of them. Yes, I mean, it's, he, he was very cagey about saying how it would apply. And someone did ask him and he sort of said, well, it'll be down to the judge in the individual case. Um, and of course, there's an access to justice issue. So they are obviously concerned. Most of our cases often involve parties who can both afford proper tech but obviously that may be that may be an issue. But yeah, it was it was a fascinating comment, really, that it is here to stay. And there wasn't an indication that it would just be for submissions or interim hearings. It was very much this is going to be one of the range of options that every judge will have as in the toolbox to consider for how they both case manage and try cases. Um, so very, very interesting. Well, thank you very much. Ben, do you have a question? I, Alice, I, I wondered whether you got any impression as to what proportion of your clients are coming to arrangements whereby they share the pain uh, and what proportion of them are simply storing up their disputes for the future on COVID-19. So I'd say at the beginning, it was like 75% were resolving them. There was often this automatic, oh, we'll just do 50-50 and get on with it. But in recent times, the, the, the amounts involved are getting larger and larger and the period of time. So I'd say that's probably shifted. But I, I'd say it's still 65, 35. You know, people also cash is king right now. So people need money. So often it's, it's used as leverage to get a deal. But I am aware there are some very big problems out there that will have to be resolved the difficulty is they're normally mixed with other pre-existing problems. So the ones that are difficult are the ones that have multiple causes, in my experience. But I don't know if you've had a different experience, Ben. No, I've had the same experience. And, and I suppose that the follow-up question is, do you think we're now going to see all, all our contracts rewritten? So that as in, interruption, as in business interruption insurance, we now have clauses that deal with this kind of problem? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it would almost be negligent to enter into a contract that didn't make provision for this going forward, because we now know this is something that can happen um, and will continue to affect contracts that are being signed now. But obviously, unfortunately, this might not be the last pandemic that we have to face. So it will be really fascinating to see how those are formulated. Although I haven't had that many requests for advice on this drafting. Um, so, yeah. And so it's interesting to learn that uh, Singapore have, have put something into statute to deal with this. Are there any other jurisdictions who have uh, got something onto the books that quickly? I'm not, I'm not aware. I think Singapore, with its mega efficiency, dealt with it. Although what's interesting is even in Singapore, people found things to argue about in the wording of the provisions. So what did materially caused, etc.? cetera. Um, but no, I'm not aware, but others, others may be and may have come across it. Of course, somewhere like the DFC uh, has, more, has interesting provisions whereby you can override the contractual provisions in certain circumstances mm -hmm. to provide a fairer outcome. Um, I think the other thing I have seen a lot more of is good faith. A lot of people, a lot of clients are asking about, can we use good faith in terms of how you interpret the provisions? And people have got very excited about the post office and Bates decision. And of mm. course, you know, if you're behaving fairly, does that include taking into account COVID? Um, so that's that's a whole new development that I've seen in actually in the last month. And has that that good faith aspect been cropping up on all types of contracts, or um, more of the, uh, the, the the more creative ones where there have been more amendments made? Uh, I'd say, well, obviously some. NEC contracts, et cetera, have express provisions within them um, and relational contracts or very, very big projects. And I think that's where they tend to cross up, crop up. Obviously, JCT less, less so um, because they're so, the provisions are so specific. But yes, certainly within NEC context, definitely. And Lisa, I was interested to hear what you said about the Chancellor. Mm. saying that it's very much down to an individual judge's discretion. Reminded me a little bit of when we all first started out going to the county court, not knowing whether you're going to be robed or unrobed or, or, or whatever. Um, that, that was slightly worrying. I mean, surely they've got to, uh, they've got to be more guidelines given, given out. But you say he didn't give any um, direction as to that. No, I mean, he, he actually said they're not planning to do that because they think it will then become too prescriptive. Like they almost want to keep it floating. He did also say, one thing he did say that's important that slightly qualifies it is they're very keen to ensure what he calls the sanctity of the court uh, is preserved. And one thing they're worried about is that uh, remote hearings will make it so informal that people will forget that there so it's it's a slight it's a slight contradiction there so he absolutely was not saying all hearings are going to be remote but he certainly was raising it as a possibility mm. for more than just interim hearings or other hearings i certainly think gone are the days where you make someone get on a plane and come to australia to give evidence in courts that's obviously can be dealt with remotely um but it was very interesting that he, that yes, that they obviously are thinking about this and investing in tech to make it possible. I think one of the drivers may also be financial in that you, you can ask Sue about this later, but um, obviously if you've got judges in London and you need them to hear things in the region, I think that's, that's something he did mention a couple of times that they were looking at doing. And then of course they'd have to have, they could have fewer judges lodgings, all those things. Yeah. So I don't know if there's also that aspect to it. And if you're in London, what difference it will make, you know, mm -hmm. query. But I did, I did, I have recently had a tribunal where we, both parties wanted hybrid and the tribunal wanted to do it fully remote. They were very keen. And there's two former judges on that tribunal. Um, but they were super keen to be arbitrators in the comfort of their own homes. So just, uh, and they very cleverly told the parties that obviously at present, there's still enough uncertainty about vaccines and safety um, to mean that, that the parties effectively had to accept that. But yeah, so it was an interesting dynamic. Um, well, I, 
might, might I ask a, a brief question harking back to the practicalities of running force majeure arguments? Mm. So you, you rightly and understandably focus on the black letter analysis, but have any of your clients um, sought specific advice about the need for either more rigorous delay analysis or record keeping of the particulars of loss and expense or delays. You mentioned one client wanted to injunct a, a liquidated damage <laughs> yeah. claim. So, so have you seen that ancillary to these types of arguments and the disruption they cause is a need? No, that I've, yeah. Is, 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 you know, a need for maybe more rigorous programmatic or delay analysis or record keeping in general? Uh, no, the opposite. So all clients now want the outcome, you know, the, the legal remedy that they can enforce without having to do that. And I would say there is a big problem with records. I don't know if anyone else has ever had a client I'll ask them proactively for how they keep good records. You'd probably all be out of a job if that was the case. But I, I am seeing a lot of clients saying, we don't want to go through all of this. Like, what, what, what's the answer? How can we? How can we injunct the LDs? How can we knock this out? You know, people are becoming impatient and wanting wanting answers for how to deal with things. Also, when they're very big losses, they're having to be reported now openly. So there have been quite a lot of difficult decisions, I think, by companies who are really worried about the impact on their business. And there are huge losses out there that I think we may start to see being reported in, in accounts. Well, Annalise, thank you very much indeed for a really interesting talk. And um, we hope we'll uh, see you again on one of these. Yeah, well, hopefully in person. <laughs> thank you. Thanks all for your patience, particularly with my rock star attempt at the slides, but we got there in the end. <laughs>